Hi everybody, today I am speaking with Emily who works for Bioregional, it's a sustainability charity uh, working with businesses, local authorities, that kind of thing to um, enhance sustainability and make all of our, all of our lives better through um, thinking about sustainability in a more holistic way. Last year Emily was involved in a website design project, redesign project which involved looking at the structure and the content of the website. Um, it's quite a fully fledged project by the sound of it and obviously a big part of that was the content audit and the way that they use content um, going forward. So this discussion today is going to be focusing on that portion of the project, the content audit, content production and the restructuring of everything. So hopefully there'll be some tips and insights that you can take from this to, to implement into your own projects um, going forward. So, um, okay, I'd just like to say um, hello to Emily um, and just hand it over to you for a moment to talk about uh, what Bioregional is, your role there, and touch on a little bit about um, this project. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, yep, yeah, so I'm Emily. I'm the Digital Communications Manager at Bioregional. Um, so I'm in charge of the website, um, our content, social media, all that kind of thing. Um, and as Matt said, we're a sustainability charity um, and we work with partners to help them move towards something we, called, we call One Planet Living, um, which is happy, healthy lives for everyone within the limits of the planet, leaving space for wildlife and wilderness. Um, and as Matt also said, we work with a really wide range of audiences, so kind of from retailers to property developers and local authorities. Um, we're also quite a unique charity um, in that most of our work is consultancy, um, so we kind of sell services to these organisations to help them become more sustainable. Um, and in 2018, I managed our website redesign, which included a complete restructure um, and overhaul of the content on our website. Okay, so I mean, what's typical um, in my experience, a lot of, of organisations, they realise they need a new website and then they just go ahead and do it and they'll kind of like sort of factor content into that process using largely what they already have um, or maybe they'll rewrite a little bit here and there but really it seems to me that content is so fundamental that really you should look at that from the inside out and restructure your website around that. So I just kind of... What was the motivation um, f for, for, that you guys came up against for um, changing that website content and not simply redesigning around existing content? Um, basically, we realised that our website wasn't fit for purpose. Um, so um, it's been kind of a growing realisation as we kind of overhauled our general approach to communications um, and marketing at Bioregional. Um, we realised the website lacked focus. Um, it's um, kind of like our services, so the main way we generate our income, were completely buried in the website. It didn't reflect adequately what we actually did um, at that point anymore. Um, so it's basically just acting as a kind of an information site rather than something that's going to help us generate leads um, and kind of, well, generate leads, but also speak to our audiences and provide value for them. Um, and kind of looking at that, it became clear that the biggest part of that was the content and that was the biggest thing that we could change to, to enhance that. Um, and we realised that our content kind of had no calls to action. Um, there wasn't much value added, so there was kind of no sense of why our audiences should want to work with us. Um, and if they did want to work with us and they did want to get in contact, there was actually no easy way for them to do that either. So the content didn't direct people to getting in contact with us, which is kind of now the main KPI for our website. Um, so we decided we wanted to create a website filled with content um, that kind of clearly stated what we did um, and made it easier for our easy, well, really easy for our audiences to find what they were looking for. Um, improved our SEO, so we were more visible on Google. Um, helped solve our audience's problems um, and inspired them to make sustainable change. Um, and kind of guided them on an intuitive journey through our website that hopefully ended up with them getting in contact with us or finding the answer to their problem. Um, so, you know, no small task, just, you know, breeze through that in a, a week or so. Yeah. Um, we actually had a lot of this content already on the website um, in some form or another, but 
basically it just kind of needed editing, refining, bringing out, making more visible, um, or in some cases, just stripping for parts. Sounds very complicated. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, it was quite a process, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think what is interesting to me is you talked about SEO there, you talked about visibility, uh, but also KPI. Like the KPI is to get people to get in touch with you. So the content doesn't exist just to be wishy-washy and sort of just to be there for the sake of being there. It has an actual tangible uh, metric behind it, and that's to get people to, to, to get in touch with you in some way. Mm -hmm. So how did you actually go about conducting the, the, the audit of your existing content? And um, what were the kind of what was the process you used to decide which content remained and which content had to be sort of either rewritten or put, or put down. Put yeah. <laughs> um, so from the discuss discovery process for the website, um, we kind of had a, a clear picture of what the main structure should be. And that involved kind of user testing um, as well with our key audiences. So we had a sense of the structure and we also had a sense of who our main audiences were. Um, so I, I basically boiled our kind of content checklist down to three questions. Um, does this com content demonstrate what we do? Um, is it useful to our audiences? Um, and also what's the call to action? Um, and then I used a plugin for WordPress, basically which downloaded all the URLs from our website into an Excel. Um, and from there, I kind of went through every single piece of content on the website, um, playing a kind of content version of snog, marry, avoid, um, keep, edit, delete. Um, I was pretty ruthless um, on, on the kind of, on what was gonna get deleted. Um, and no piece of remaining content went untouched from kind of complete rewrites um, to adding new search engine optimization terms and kind of slight tweaks. Um, but it was actually a really great process also for kind of showing us the gaps um, once I kind of knew what what we had and what we were getting rid of. Um, so, you know, what, there are a lot of missing kind of case studies for specific services that we do, blogs that would fulfill a really important kind of audience question, audience need, or, an, you know, an SEO keyword that we wanted to appear for. Um, and by the end of the process, our website is actually kind of pretty much halved in size. Um, and it's just become so much more streamlined and more effective at getting our audiences from kind of A to B. B hopefully being them getting in touch or downloading resource or reading a blog, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> an outcome from that. So the, the website, you said it, it halved in size. I mean, that's, it goes to show how much uh, sort of content builds up over time if it's not sort of crawled and audited in, in, a, in the right yeah. way. Um, I've got a question for you that's slightly off script, that I hope doesn't throw too much of a okay. curveball. Um, but when, so you said you were quite ruthless in cutting down that content. Did that produce any, any sort of conflicts internally? Were, were, were people, uh, you know, concerned that content was being removed? Um, what, what, what did that look like? So we knew that this that would be a problem um, kind of from the beginning and, and understandably so, you know, people um, become quite attached to projects that have been run in the past um, and case studies that have been produced about this work um, and blogs and things like that. Um, you know, they've got they've got their priorities and their needs and you, and you need to understand that. Um, so we went into it very much understanding that. And one of our, um, so our website agency, William Joseph, was really great at knowing that you have to bring your audience on the journey. Sorry, you have to bring, well, it is an audience. Your, your colleagues are an audience. Um, you have to bring your colleagues on the journey with you. Um, so that was kind of right up front. We um, had a, a user journey brainstorming session where we looked at our key audiences um, and what they needed from us and how we wanted to work with them. And that was a really useful process and kind of getting our um, colleagues to focus on what, uh, you know, what our priorities are and being focused and understanding that actually bi-regional today looks very different to how it did five years ago. Um, and um, just because we're getting rid of things, it doesn't mean necessarily mean they're going forever. Um, so one example of this um, is there were some case studies on the website that showed like really important aspects of our heritage, which reflect where we are today. But they're no longer services that we provide. They're no longer appealing to audiences that we want to work with necessarily anymore. Um, but actually, we took some of those stories and put them in a, a timeline video on our About Us page. 
So we kind of repurposed that content. It was no longer there as a case study that wasn't doing anything, but it was, it was now on our About Us page reflecting kind of our heritage. And those, all those stories as well are, are kind of kept in our case study archive um, in our kind of, you know, on our online SharePoint um, to be used for kind of funding applications and things like that. So it's not like the content, you know, literally in the bin. Mm. Um, it's still there to be used, just maybe slightly differently from how it, it used to be used. Yeah, it sounds like you sort of extracted as, as much value from the existing content as possible, repurposed it, re rewrote it, and that kind of thing. Um, but also, I like the idea of, uh, you know, getting your internal stakeholders on, on board by bringing them along with you and just saying, look, it's not a case of just canning what we've already got. It's a case of making the most of what we've already got, and you can be a part of that. Yes, definitely. Um, and actually, that's something that we've been quite interested in at Bioregional for the last few years anyway, is kind of doing kind of internal upskilling. Um, so during the summer, um, when things are a bit quieter, we've run um, workshops with our kind of internal seminars with our staff um, on um, kind of we've done social media, we've done um, good writing, we've done storytelling, um, kind of perfecting your elevator pitch. Um, and all of those are really useful things for our colleagues, but they also kind of serve another purpose, which is getting them to kind of understand that audience and purpose are the cornerstone of any piece of comms. Um, and once that's kind of, that hurdle's overcome, I think mm. things become a lot easier. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I say this so much, but it's sort of a mindset shift, isn't it, towards understanding. Um, like you said just then, or, or audience and purpose. Once you have that down, then everything kind of, Sort of flourishes from it. If you try and if you try and produce anything without that in mind, you end up just producing a lot of rubbish yeah. <laughs> or at least stuff that's ineffective. You know, so yeah, yeah, that doesn't serve your purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've got down written here in your notes um, the content creation process, and you mentioned something called pair writing, which I have to say is is quite new to me. It's not something that I've ever. Um, engaged in myself but I've sort of heard of it um, so for people watching watching this video um, tell us what pair writing is. Um, so uh, first up if you've not read Sarah Richards book on content design as soon as you've finished watching this go and go and buy it um, it's brilliant um, and from that um, and kind of a lot of trial and error we've really nailed a content um, design process that works for us. So I'm just going to go over that and then I'll, I'll explain what pair writing is because it kind of follows. Yeah. Um, so basically we kind of book 20 minutes um, face to face with colleagues to get key points for a new piece of content, whether it be a case study or a new service page um, and uh, send them a clear brief beforehand. Um, so including what we're going to leave the meeting with and what decisions need to be made. So everyone's on the same page and we're managing expectations. Um, and then we start the meeting by helping them think about audience and purpose um, and user personas are really, really useful for that. Um, and also, uh, and, and I insist, and I mean insist on a, a firm deadline um, and um, one person for final sign off is kind of like very key for avoiding back and forth sign offs, which I mean, is just the worst term ever and is no fun, no fun for anyone. Um, so in her book on content design, Sarah Richards also um, outlines something called um, pair writing, which is where you actually sit side by side with your colleague at a laptop um, and try and write something together. Um, and it's really useful for people who you know are going to want a bit more say in the final product. Um, and, you know, some colleagues, some of my colleagues, you know, we, I sit, get some key points from them. I write something up, they look at it and go, yeah, great. Um, others, um, they want a bit more say, and that's completely understandable, you know, work that you're doing, you feel very passionate about, and you want to see it represented in the best way. Um, so it's really useful for doing that. Um, it's also really, really useful for um, explaining to people as you go along why you're writing things in the way you are. For example, removing jargon. Um, so that's a big thing that everyone comes up against. You know, I, I've had colleagues say to me, but, you know, removing jargon is, is dumbing it down. Um, and it's much, much easier to sit next to someone and explain why you're doing something rather than writing something in, you know, behind the closed doors um, and then sending it to them via email and then being like, well, this isn't what I said. This isn't what I sent over. Um, so it can be a really useful process um, for getting things to a point. You know, you're not going to end up with a finished product, 
Um, but getting things to the point where you can say, oh yeah, we're both kind of happy with that general structure. And then you can kind of go away, refine and send over to them knowing that, you know, they're not going to get a horrible yeah. shock. When they- yeah, yeah. So, so, so pair writing is more, as, as I understand it, more about planning, planning the content together. Um, mm. Because like you said, it's not going to be a finished finished product no. you're not going to actually write something like one share one sentence each you're going to actually just write the uh, the core of that content and then somebody else will kind of finish it up on their own and then kind of get signed off that way exactly um it just yeah it can just be a really useful tool for yeah and it's also a really useful tool for kind of upskilling as well in terms of kind of explaining what things you know like I said the the kind of jargon dumbing down example I mean you know if you can go into that meeting and explain to people why like opening up language um I can't remember I think it, it, it may be Sarah Richards who says that you know it's not dumbing down it's opening up um and um I think that's a really useful way to kind of be able to explain to people and you know even backing up with research you know that you know like people opening up a web page that's got loads of Technical terms, you know, we're at Bioregional, we do a lot of energy work um, and, you know, there's stuff like U values, you know, air tightness, you know, all these kinds of things, which, you never, you know, I don't understand, let alone, you know, people who haven't ever come across energy officials. It's educational, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So it's, um, it's good to kind of think about that and um, yeah. how you're going to communicate I mean, things. That, you know, it's, it's not dumbing down, it's opening up. I really like that reframing of it, actually. That's an interesting mm. way of looking at it. Um, it, it puts me in mind that, as well of a, as of a previous um, discussion that um, I had with somebody on the merits of co-production, so bringing service users into the into the actual project as well, uh, it seems to me that it's it's something that is a good approach if you're not wanting to just kind of deliver something to somebody and say, there you go, that's done now. Um, yeah, you know, it's that whole kind of nothing about me without me type mentality, which um, I think has a lot of merit. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously there's a lot of work going into this. How do you go about ensuring that you maintain this, this level, um, this standard as you produce content into the future? Because I know that you do this as part of a website restructuring or redesign process. Um, obviously once it's all launched and gone, it can be very, very easy then to let your standards slip on the content you produce. So how do you ensure that that doesn't happen? Um, so I think I've kind of alluded to both these things, but I think um, culture and process are key to kind of retaining things consistently. Um, so in terms of culture, um, as I said, we want to create a culture by regional where um, understanding the audience and purpose are the cornerstone of any piece of content is not limited to the comms team. It's everyone gets that. Um, so, so we've been running internal seminars and things like that. Um, and also the website redesign process was a really useful process for engaging our colleagues and kind of spreading digital best practice across the organization. Um, so William Joseph, our website agency, we're talking about a thing, um, something called digital maturity, um, which is organizations that kind of understand digital get it, you know, um, and um, that was a, a, you know, a key aim for our website redesign process was to kind of boost that in our organization and it's, it's definitely worked. Um, and then in terms of kind of the process um, of um, content design, we can try and stick to the, this process. We've kind of created and refined it. I mean, it's in, this has like no, been no short time coming, you know, it's been like three years of kind of like trial and error on things like our, you know, writing case studies, but also our annual review um, and the website redesign itself. Um, and also during the website redesign, we created templates for key content types. Um, so, um, that just helps make things more consistent. So now whenever I've got to write a new case study, I can just go and open up a document that's got, you know, how we want to structure a case study roughly. I mean, obviously it's not going to be a carbon copy, but um, that makes things really easy. And then it also means that you can send those content um, templates out to colleagues um, and know if they want to give it, you know, give a writing case study or a new service page a shot that you're going to get something back which is going to be easy to edit so yeah so it's around the process but also the materials and the kind of internal toolkit that you have to work against to ensure that um, those standards are met going forward yeah definitely in in terms of uh because this is obviously talking about the website but obviously marketing strategies tend to expand beyond the website how do you go about in, how does this process go about informing social media content newsletters printed literature uh, and all this kind of stuff 
a good question. I think it was a really useful process in kind of making us really razor sharp focused on what our priorities are um, and who we're writing for. So every piece of content that we have now has a specific purpose and a specific specific audience. Um, and if it doesn't, it's not going from the website. And I think that just kind of filters down into everything else that we're doing. Um, and we've got a um, content strategy and a content calendar um, and things like kind of newsletters and um, social media for kind of big pieces of content is, is built into that now. Um, so I think more than anything, it just really helped us be a bit more strategic and make sure that everything is kind of nested, you know, like our content strategy is not developed um, in isolation. It, it's uh, developed after we've done our marketing priorities um, and then our social media kind of strategy is developed after we've done those two um, and everything kind of feeds in and informs each other. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, some stuff doesn't work um, and it's always a process of trial and error and, and digging into those analytics and seeing what's working. Um, but yeah, I think it's just kind of really helped us be focused. I mean, we're, we're quite a small team. There's um, three of us um, and actually for the last six months we've been recruiting. So there's only been two of us. Um, so um, having that kind of razor sharp focus is, is really useful um, when you're kind of needing to prioritize. Yeah, I, I think the idea of fe everything feeding into the overall strategy makes sense. Um, obviously, that can be quite difficult to get a handle on. and it'll, it'll take time and practice to make sure that you do sustain that. So yeah. just to, to give a solid example, then, when a piece of content is produced, are you already thinking about how that's going to be used on social media? Maybe how you might turn it into a video or how you repackage it in some other way? Is that, you know, from the very inception of that piece of content, thinking about that sort of stuff? Definitely. So our actual content um, calendar for the year has a, uh, a line, um, a column um, about repurposing. Um, and also if we've kind of created, um, so uh, created content that can be kind of stacked up as well um, into an insight, you know, a white paper or that kind of thing. Um, so we definitely look at the year as a whole. Um, and actually that's one of um, my kind of top tips for producing content, especially as a small team. Um, you know, you need to think about how you're gonna kind of repurpose um, and reuse content that you've already got. Um, not only because it saves you time, but it also opens it up to new audiences. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of like things like social media, um, we've um, been creating quite a few um, guides for our audiences recently. Um, and yeah, thinking about kind of making sure that all the um, graphics and that can be reused on social media and things like that is is just makes things so much easier than kind of getting to the end of the project and going, oh God, okay, right, how are we going to share this on social media now? Yes, yeah. Uh, you don't want to find yourself in a position where you're having to produce new things again or produce the same thing in different yeah. ways at the last minute. Definitely. You want to think about that up yeah. front. Yeah. And that's not to say that doesn't still happen to us occasionally, but um, I think we've definitely kind of got better at, over the last few years of, of making sure that we're thinking about things up front um, rather than any kind of last minute mad panic. Yeah, it's a good way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, well, so, I mean, for, for people watching this, this video, then that uh, may be going through content production uh, process at the moment or a website redesign. Or may just you know know that they need to do something along these lines. What are your kind of takeaways and, and top tips for creating effective content that actually has a lot of value? Um, it's a really good question. I, I've spent a, kind of a while thinking about this, um, and I think first up, it's really important to note that um, like valuable content. Um, the way I'm looking at it is it's like valuable for your audiences, but also valuable for you as an organisation. Um, so I think first up, and you know, I've said this so many times already, but you know, think about what your audience needs, like who are you writing for? What problem do they need solving? Um, creating user personas is really valuable for this, um, especially to use with colleagues. So you can kind of say to them like, well, what's Sandra going to want? What does Sandra need? What's Sandra's problem? Um, kind of putting a face to an audience is a really useful way of going about things and makes things more tangible. Um, and then thinking about what you need um, as an organization. So how is this piece of content gonna help you achieve your objectives? Um, and thinking about what the call 
to action is and what success looks like for that piece of content. So having KPIs, I would recommend having KPIs for all of your content, um, but especially for kind of big pieces that you've spent a lot of time on. Um, you know, are you wanting people to get in touch with you? Are you wanting them to download a resource? Are you wanting them to sign up to your newsletter? Um, so having a really clear picture of what that is before you start producing content is really useful. Um, and then also doing your research. Um, so when I was doing the content audit for our website, um, I was digging into the analytics, you know, what's performing, what's not performing. Um, asking your audiences what they want is really powerful if you can do that. Um, so during our website redesign process, we did user testing and it was really interesting to see that when our um, key audiences went onto our website, the first thing they headed for was our case studies um, because they wanted to know who we're working with and what value we were adding. Um, and so it's just so useful to know that because obviously when, it's not the only content we're going to produce, but you know, when you're kind of stretched for time, knowing that case studies are really valuable to your audiences then you can kind of prioritize those and put the effort in that, that they need check out the competition you know what else what are people doing out there um obviously you don't nick ideas but being inspired is fine um and um investing time in learning about best practice um you know we're all stretched for time but you know just following the right people on twitter if you're not a member of the third sector pr and comms facebook group get on it there's so much useful advice in there um, and there's a lot of, you know, useful free seminars, Google Digital Garage, things like that. Mm. Um, and then the final one um, that I've already kind of mentioned is thinking <coughs> strategically. Um, so looking at your content calendar as, um, you know, a, a year thing and how you can repurpose, reuse um, content. And, you know, it's going to save you time as well as potentially reach new people. Sure, sure. So, um, I mean, doing the research, that's obviously seems to be the thread that runs through all of this is making sure that you know who you're talking to uh, and, and, and the purpose for, for why you're doing that. But also having, like you said, thinking strategically. So thinking about outcomes, KPIs and all this kind of stuff. In a way, thinking about just a piece of content as a landing page in its own right, um, i.e. this 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 page exists for a reason, um, then that's a good way to go. I think you talked about personas a couple of times as well, and that's something that, that I've discussed in the past. Um, do, would you mind just talking us through a little bit about how you come to produce those, those personas? Yeah, definitely. Um, so through the website redesign process, we kind of identified our key audiences. Um, and for each of those, um, I we kind of tried to create um, a persona that reflects those through talking to them, um, talking to our colleagues, um, and kind of doing a bit of desk research as well. Um, so this has very much been done on a budget. We haven't kind of um, invested a lot of time and money in this, um, but it's kind of a useful thing just to have an overview of what people are going to be are going to be doing when they get to your website and what they're looking for um and um yeah so i've yeah i've kind of written up like little um uh kind of personas basically with a photo from kind of some stock imagery um and uh they're all kind of based on like people that we've worked with or um no so you kind of list out like their prop you know their what's their problem like what's the question they're asking when they come to your website um what are they looking for you know what are they going to want to leave your website with um and it just really helps focus you on on what that looks like mm. um and actually i think that's something i'm going to want to revisit next year um because it's not something we put a lot of time and effort into um just because it can be quite um hard to find out if you're not kind of doing detailed kind of interviews and things like that um, but yeah, the website redesign process was really useful. And yeah, talking to your colleagues um, about who they're working with and what they think their problems are is, is really illuminating. So if you can like book a couple of like 15 minute slots in or just pick their brain over lunch, um, I'd really recommend that. Yeah, because everyone's got a different view, haven't they? On, 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 on not just the project itself, but what they want, want to get out of it and, and the way they think that that's going. So yeah, it makes sense to involve people in that process. Yeah. 
All right, well, uh, cool. That's all my questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. Um, that was really helpful. Thank you.